So it's quarter past, so it's maybe time to start. Welcome, Tomas, who is giving a talk about Kinshin's inequality with sharp constants. So please. Thank you, Christoph, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you all for showing up. Uh, it's of course a pleasure to give a talk at this winter school and my talk is going to be in the largest part a uh, survey of well-known results on kinching inequalities and since it's a it's the last talk of today's session I would like to keep it light and to begin uh, let me start with a sort of Wednesday night trivia question um who are these uh, two gentlemen and why uh, are they put on the same slide mm, is well, one of them kinchen <laughs> right i was gonna say that the answer comes on the next slide you don't have to answer uh, so there you go um this is the answer um so what are we going to look at today is uh okay for the first part the sequence of independent rather marker random variables epsilon one epsilon two so each one takes value plus minus one with probability one half we are going to consider s which is the uh, weighted sum of these independent random signs and for now we will take weights aj which are just real numbers and sp will denote as usual the lp norm of, of s and Kinchin in 23, uh, independently Littlewood in 30, proved that for every P and Q positive, there is a constant CPQ, which depends only on P and Q, nothing else, such that for every number of summons N and every choice of weights, uh, A, the P norm of s is upper bounded by the constant times the qth norm of s and they actually came came to look at this inequality uh, motivated by two different things so kinchin uh, kinchin established this inequality in his uh, early paper on the, the law of iterated logarithm whereas little would later on uh, a bit later uh, looked at uh, boundedness of bilinear forms uh, and this establishing his celebrated four-thirds inequality he he first actually had to prove this kind of result mm. so we will be interested in uh, best constants in these type of inequalities um, so from now on cpq will mean the best the best number p uh, c that you can put in here the smallest number such that this inequality holds for every n and, and every choice of the weights and of course when what is easy is when p is less than q just by monotonicity of of moments of, of lp norms that they grow with p and the constant holds and uh, the inequality holds with constant one and this is actually sharp value, as you can see in the case n equals one, because random sign has uh, all moments uh, the same, because it's uh, with, with the absolute values a constant random variable. Now, what of course this inequality is non-trivial uh, and gets interesting when p is greater than q when we compare larger moment versus a smaller one. And here, the best value of this constant is known only in in uh, the following cases um, when either p or q is equal to two so we compare versus the l2 norm which is then explicitly just the sum of the squares of the weights and this was uh, done in landmark work of Hagerup in 82 and the most difficult technical parts of his proof were was simplified by quite an ingenious uh, lemma of Nazarov and Podkoritov, uh, which allows to handle quite delicate integral inequalities. And so they covered in the paper one difficult range of parameters in Hagerup's work, and then later Moidhoz finished this uh, covering another range of parameters. And 
Another case when we know CPQ is when both P and Q are even integers, and this is uh, resolved by Nayar and Oleshkevich uh, from 2012, which I'll mention uh, later on uh, in more detail. Now, okay, we know those uh, sharp uh, values of CPQ, but of course it's interesting to ask what are the extremizing sequences? Or in other words, what are the values of these sharp constants? Um, so this turns out to be not too complicated, actually. The sharpness comes from, uh, when P is greater than Q, just comes from two extremizing sequences. It's either the case when N is equal to two, so we have just two weights and they are taken to be equal. That's one case. Another case is when the number of summons goes to infinity and the weights are also taken to be all the same. And so the first case uh, kicks in. So the first case is the worst case when uh, we compare the second moment with uh, qth moment for q between zero and uh, some constant which is slightly less than two. And then you can find uh, from, from the description of the extremizer, the value of the constant, of course. And the asymptotic uh, extreme case occurs in all the other cases when we know CPQ. So when you compare the second moment versus higher moments than this constant uh, 1.82 and the even moments as well. And here the value of the constant by the central limit theorem is of course given by by Gaussian uh, distribution. So if G throughout the talk will stand for standard Gaussian, and then CPQ is just the ratio of, of the Gaussian moments. All right, so this is about the values. Now I would like to spend a little bit of, of uh, our time discussing the particular case C21. So when you compare the L2 norm versus the L1 norm. And the, the, the value square root two was actually conjectured uh, already in Littlewood's paper, the one I mentioned from 1930. And 46, late, 46 years later, Sharik uh, confirmed Littlewood's conjecture that the sharp constant in this case is root two. Um, and okay, I, I want to keep this, this uh, talk light, but still I would like to show maybe uh, one not entirely trivial argument. So I've, I've chosen uh, a Gar Garling's proof of a slightly weaker bound. Instead of square root two, uh, we can establish this inequality with square root e uh, now I put this, okay, let me explain this question mark here. Uh, I think it's Garling's proof, Garling's proof but um, I've, I heard uh, this proof from Krzysztof Oleszkiewicz, who heard this proof from Stanisław Kwapień, who heard this proof from uh, Ben Garling, and um, so that's the story. And the reassuring point is that this argument is also included as one of the exercises in Ben's uh, uh, book, uh, Inequalities, a Journey into Linear Analysis. So, um, um, okay, so how can we, how can we, uh, so our task is to lower bound the L1 norm of, of this weighted sum of, of random variables. So let's, let's jump into the last line of this proof. What is the, uh, the basic idea of this argument? So, okay, so how can you uh, estimate the absolute value of, of random variables expectation? Well, you could naively just put the expectation inside by, uh, by the triangle inequality, but you're gonna end up with zero, right? Because S, S is a symmetric random variable expectation zero. So you're not gonna gain much, but imagine uh, multiplying before doing this, this uh, averaging inside the absolute value. Imagine multiplying S by some bounded random variable, bounded pointwise by one, okay, which, and this random variable is meant to uh, sort of cut, 
cut out an essential piece from S that after averaging will give you some non-trivial quantity. So that's the idea, right? Like in Fourier analysis. So to, to extract some, uh, some non-trivial part, we, we use a multiplier, okay? And here the, the, the cleverness of course comes from how to choose such a multiplier so that it's on one hand bounded and on the other hand, it, it does the job of selecting from S what's, what's relevant. So, so what can we do? Okay, so, so to, more specifically, this multiplier which we are going to use is quite interesting. We take the product of one plus I a j epsilon j. I here is the uh, imaginary unit and a j are our real weights, okay? And then we take the random sign. So now it's, uh, on one hand, it's quite easy to see that m indeed is pointwise bounded. And uh, the, if you just do the, the trivial bound for you know, one plus x is less than or equal to e to the x, you just get under the normalization that the weights uh, sum up with squares to one, you get square root E as the upper bound of the norm of, of M, L infinity norm of M. But on the other hand, it's quite a pleasant computation to see that actually the average of S times M is just I. Okay, it's not zero, it's I. It's something that mod is of modulus one. And this is because, okay, uh, you just expand this product and, and then just, okay, so you get those symmetric uh, uh, elementary functions, right, in those a, j, epsilon, j. And then if you multiply by, by some fixed, let's say, epsilon one, all the expectations here will vanish except for the one that comes in the linear part in this expansion. So you just, you just uh, end up with the, uh, with uh, with i, okay, and then then putting these pieces together results uh, results with uh, just the promise bound by uh, one over square root e. Okay, so that's uh, that's one proof. Now um, I would like to excuse me. Uh, I I just want yeah. to mention that later uh, after uh -huh. we talked. I think I saw this argument in some uh, quite old book by Katznelson. So ah, okay. maybe he was the author of, of that argument. Okay, yeah, I guess we should so just cool, ask cool Yeah. Response. <laughs> Thanks, Krzysztof. All right. Um, by the way, I should have mentioned that in the very beginning. Feel free to interrupt if you have any comments, questions, use the chat, I'll try to monitor it. Uh, uh, to keep it as interactive as possible, if you like. All right, um, so now I would like to uh, dwell on this C to one and highlight uh, uh, probably the shortest proof uh, possible of Sharek's result and its significant generalization. So Latawa and Oleshkiewicz in 94 proved the following generalization of, of uh, Sharek's inequality. For every normed space, let's call it V with some norm, I will denote it double bar, we have Kinchin's inequality where the weights AJ are now taken, not just real numbers by vectors in, in our, our vector space. And the expectation is of the magnitude of the weighted sum measured with the endowed norm that we have. And Amazingly, the constant is, is still root two in such a generalization of this inequality. Okay. Um, and just a few words about this absolutely gorgeous and ingenious proof. And this is, this is, per, this is perhaps, okay, you could argue even probably shorter than uh, the previous proof I showed with the worst, con worst constant. All right. So you can view this magnitude of the weighted sum as a function on the discrete uh, cube, okay? And on one hand, you have Poincaré inequality on the discrete cube, okay? Uh, here, this delta is uh, the discrete Laplacian. I, I don't want to go into this exact details, but okay, there's, there's Poincaré inequality with the discrete Laplacian on the discrete cube. 
and uh, it holds for every function with with constant one but because f is even in our case it can be sharpened uh, by putting two here on the left hand side and on the other hand the triangle inequality which we which we know because we are dealing with a norm allows to put a pointwise bound on on this discrete Laplacian in terms of f minus uh, delta f is pointwise bounded by f, and these two uh, observations together give the whole proof. It's, it's just one line of, of of computation now. So twice the variance is of course the second uh, the expectation of square minus the square of the expectation upper bounded f minus Laplacian f, which is pointwise upper bounded by the inner product of f with itself which is the L2 norm of F squared. And now you just reshuffle and, and get what, what was promised. Um, now this, is, this is really proof from the book of, of this result. Uh, and this of course prompts uh, the next question about looking into the uh, you know, more general constants. So given a normed uh, space, what is the best constant in Kinch inequality for, uh, for other values, P and Q? Okay, we've just seen, let's see, 2, 1 is always root 2, no matter what space you take. Here, it's of course non-trivial even to show that these constants uh, uh, can be taken independent of, of the known space. So it, this was established by Kahan in 64, that if you take supremal value of such a constant over uh, choice of a norm space, which we will denote CP tilde, that this is finite number. Kvapian conjectures that the worst case with, uh, with respect to the choice of the norm space is the, just the real line. So the Kinchin constants, um, CP tilde are the same as CP uh, without the tilde. And there are some strong evidences for this uh, conjecture. Okay, so this has been fully established only in the basically two cases when we know the value of CP tilde. So as we have just seen, uh, it's root two when uh, we have C to one. And a bit later, Kvapin, Latau and Oleshkevich also did use um, from similar sort of ideas using using those uh, Poincaré type of inequalities, um, they extended and they also got C42 that it's equal to uh, the same value as, as we have in the real case coming from Ga Gaussian moments. Um, and then we know that the conjecture is true in the following asymptotic uh, sense. So by hypercontractivity, CPQ tilde can be upper bounded by square root P minus one over Q minus one. This sort of puts a strong uh, quantifying uh, a version of Kahan's result. And because Gaussian moments grow like square root P when P is large, we get the conclusion that Kvapin's conjecture holds true when both of the parameters P and Q go to infinity. So that's, that's one thing we know. And this has been uh, significantly strengthened by, by Krzysztof recently who showed that, okay, you consider the ratio of the, of the constant in Kahan's inequality and in Kinchin's inequality on the real line. And you take the supremum over one parameter, the smaller moment, and you let the higher moment go to infinity, the ratio still goes to one. So, uh, so Kvapin's conjecture is also true in the stronger asymptotic sense. Okay. Mm. And I would like to just briefly mention uh, one more uh, outcome of, uh, I mean, you can see it uh, this way, one of the outcomes of very robust and elegant proof of uh, Latawa and Oloshkevich is that we actually get, we know 
uh, stability result for Sharex uh, inequality. This is a result uh, due to the day Diane Nicolas and Cervedo from 2013. And the result is as follows. So if you take those real weights, uh, okay, without loss of generality, assume they are negative, you can reshuffle them so that they do not decrease, normalize so that they add up with squares to one. And then we have Sharex inequality plus an error term, okay? Which is just the uh, absolute constant times the L2 distance between A and the extremizing sequence. So in other words, if Sharex inequality is nearly tight, the vector of the coefficients has to be close to the extremizing one. Okay, Sharek show that uh, equality holds if and only if the extremizing sequence, if, if the sequence of weights is the extremal one, but here we have a stability version as well. And this was achieved using the, you know, going into de further details with uh, the Fourier analytic proof. So it's quite, quite a nice, nice result coming from that approach. Now I'd like to jump into a, a sort of a slightly different topic. So let's re leave random signs and let's, uh, let me briefly mention uh, some other distributions. So people, um, so there has been quite a lot of work devoted to random vectors uniform on Euclidean spheres in RD. And Kinchin inequalities comparing the L2 and LP norm of weighted sums of such random vectors have been established in, in a series of work by, by here I mentioned uh, probably not all the names. Uh, so you can view this as a, as a generalization of a random sign, right? Random sign is uniform distribution on zero dimensional sphere. Then what it's, it's higher dimensional analog, you just take uniform distribution on higher dimensional spheres. Then there is, uh, there are a few, uh, then Kinch inequalities can be uh, quite well understood in the case of so-called Gaussian mixtures. So if the independent random variables you add up come from Gaussian distribution as mixtures, uh, the, the, the additive structure is very nice because the sum of independent Gaussians is Gaussian. So you can analyze Kinch inequalities in this case quite accurately, and this was done by Ava Kampudre and by Askanazis Nayar and myself. Then um, the, the, mention, the, the, the result I mentioned earlier about even moments was actually established by the so-called ultra sub-Gaussian random variables. I'll, I'll talk about it in a second. And there's also this class of random variables called type L random variables coming from statistical mechanics developed by uh, Charles Newman, which I'll also, also discuss uh, now. Uh, so let's first talk about ultra sub Gaussian random variables. So take a symmetric random variable X. So minus X has the same distribution as X. Now X is uh, called ultra sub Gaussian if the following sequence is log concave. So A0 uh, is defined to be one. And then AM is just the ratio of the expectation of X to the two M normalized by the corresponding thing uh, for the standard Gaussian. Okay, and if this sequence of numbers is log concave, you call random variable ultra sub Gaussian. So it's not difficult, just a direct computation, uh, you know, with factorials uh, shows that random sign is ultra sub Gaussian. Um, another nice family of random variables, which is sub, uh, ultra sub Gaussian uh, is this Gaussian family X with the density X of minus X to the alpha. Alpha here has to be greater than two. And it is sort of uh, easy to see. It's sort of built in this definition that given an ultra sub Gaussian random variable, we do have the moment comparison inequality with the Gaussian constant. And this is just because, you know, if, if a sequence is log concave, um, looks like this. So those slopes are monotone. So 
the sequence am to the one over m will be non-decreasing and this immediately translates by the definition of am into this moment comparison inequality. So this is easy that for an individual ultra sub Gaussian we have the right comparison inequality. What is not easy and lies at the height of uh, Nayar and Olashkevich's paper is that uh, sums of independent ultra sub Gaussian random variables are sub ultra sub Gaussian. So particularly if you take uh, some weighted sum of independent random signs, you end up with something ultra sub Gaussian. So it will satisfy this inequality. So you get Kinchin inequality with sharp constant for even moments as a result of this. Okay, now what are these type L random variables? So X symmetric random variable is called type L if two things, uh, the moment generating function on the real line is dominated by Gaussian function. So you could say, okay, X is sub Gaussian. And the same moment generating function as a function on the complex plane has zeros only on the imaginary line. Okay? When these two things uh, occur, we call X to be type L. So for instance, a random sign is type L because the moment generating function is just cosine IZ and it's got zeros only on the imaginary line. Here, what is easy and comes, comes for free from the, from the definition is that sums of independent type L random variables are type L. This is because you know how nicely the moment generating function interacts with sums of independent random variables, right? You just get the products of those. Now, what is the non-trivial part here is the moment comparison uh, part. So it is true that when you take two even moments, P greater than Q, two even integers, the LP norm of X, if X is type L, is upper bounded by LQ norm of X with the Gaussian constant. Okay, and this was done uh, by Newman for Q equals two for the second moment. And recently with uh, Piotr, we extended this for other values of Q. And here, just to, just to highlight the, the rough idea, uh, which was already put forward by, by Newman, uh, is that, okay, if you look at the mo moment generating function, on one hand, if you just uh, do the Taylor expansion of the exponential function, you get a series of, of uh, even powers in Z because X is symmetric and the coefficients are the moments of X, roughly speaking, right? On the other hand, if you have this guarantee about the zeros of this function by Weierstrass's factorization theorem, you can write this as an infinite product. And now if you expand this infinite product into a Taylor series and powers of Z, you will get the elementary symmetric functions in those uh, coefficients. You don't care what they are. Then if you combine this with Newton's inequalities, which tell you uh, the log concavity properties of mm, elementary symmetric functions, you end up with, with actually a proof of, of a stronger result than this, that the type L random variable is ultra sub Gaussian. So the relevant uh, sequence is, is log concave. This is how this can be established. Okay, so, so I just sort of indicated why type L is uh, contained in uh, a class of ultra sub Gaussian random variables. This inclusion is actually uh, strict. There are random variables which are not type L but still ultra sub Gaussian. Then I just want to mention in passing that ultra sub Gaussianity can be uh, compared to notion of strong log concavity developed by, by Gurwitz in a totally different combinatorial uh, context. Um, and what is the advantage of type L is that it sort of allows us mm, to see examples of ultra sub Gaussian random variables, which may not be immediately clear from, from that definition. So for instance, um, type L allows to handle sums with ferromagnetic dependencies. So the specific result is as follows. There's the following uh, theorem by Newman that if you take 
random vector X who's got a density with respect to the uniform measure on the discrete cube of the following form. You take the exponent of quadratic uh, pi with non-negative coefficients plus you can throw in a linear pi with non-negative coefficients. So that's the, that's the density with respect to measure uniform on the cube. If you have such a random vector, you take weighted sum of its components with non-negative coefficients, you end up with a type L random variable. Okay, such a sum is type L. So automatically this gives us a Kinchin inequality. Now for sum, for sums of random variables, which are not necessarily independent, they might have those ferromagnetic dependencies described by, by, by this Hamiltonian. And you can also put this external ma magnetic field as, as they call it in statistical mechanics. All right, mm, so this is the story about uh, type L. I would like to finish this talk with uh, two geometrical sort of point of views on Kinchin's inequalities. So let's go back to C21 again, to Sharek's result, and let's talk about projections. Mm. So let's take, uh, just to illustrate the, the point, let's take the cross polytope in, in Rn. So just the unit ball with respect to the L1 norm, okay? So this uh, polytope has two to the N congruent facets, which are in one-to-one -one correspondence with plus minus one vectors as the normal vectors, right? You, each facet corresponds to the plus minus one vector who's, who's outer normal. All right, so now fix a unit vector A and R in, and, um, okay, and just project this cross polytope on the hyperplane perpendicular to the vector A. So let's call it A per. So you project orthogonally, so let's call it P A perp. So you get a polytope, N minus one dimensional uh, polytope. And let's ask uh, what the volume is of, of this polytope. Uh, so, okay, because this orthogonal projection is like two to one map, um, it's, it's clear that you just have to add up contributions uh, from each facet. Uh, to the volume of the projection up to a constant. And each facet contributes exactly this much, the inner product of its outer normal with the vector onto a orthogonal complement of which you project, right? This, but this is not, nothing else than just the L1 norm of the weighted sum of random signs in this guise, right? This is, this is just the expectation of, of the, uh, of, of this inner product, right? So to phrase Sharek's result geometrically, we can say that the minimum volume of the orthogonal projections of the cross polytope is attained for the extremal vector one root two, one root two and, and zeros. Okay, so, so Kinchin inequality for the first and second moment can be viewed in this nice geometric way. And this has been substantially generalized uh, by Bart and Naur, who looked into projection, extremal volume projections of BPN balls. Um, and there's just small range left to understand. Mm, so we don't know what the minimum volume as projections are for BPN balls when P is between one and two. Okay, that, that is to summarize uh, these sort of efforts. And the last thing I would like to mention is a dual problem of extremal uh, volume sections now of, of certain convex bodies. Um, so I put here in quotation mark uh, C, C2 negative one uh, and sections. So let me try to get to this and explain. So let's just consider the, uh, the cube, the L infinity uh, ball in Rn. And let's take random vector, which is uniform on, on this solid cube. So it's got uh, IID components, XJ, which are just uniform minus one, one random variables. Let's take a weighted sum 
with some coefficients which will normalize so that the squares add up to one. So we think geometrically about unit vector A in Rn. And let call, let's call F uh, the density of this weighted sum. Now, uh, what is uh, the volume of, what is the value of this density at zero? Well, it's proportional geometrically speaking to the volume of the central section of the cube, right? The value of the density at T is the volume of the section at level T. So at zero, it will be the central slice, okay? So this is, uh, this is one way how you can view <clears throat> the value of the density at zero of a random variable. On the other hand, if you just, you know, just think about it analytically, right? What is the, uh, how will I, how can I extract the value of the density at zero? If I have uh, if I have some probability distribution which is let's say bounded, well you can take negative moment, okay, and then just let it go uh, to to minus to the to, to the point where um, this integral uh, doesn't exist anymore. So in this case, it's p p when p goes to one, this thing blows up. But if you kill this. Um, uh, singularity by multiplying by the relevant thing, you will get, you will just extract the value of the density at zero. This is, this is an easy exercise uh, with, with integrals. Mm -hmm. So the value of the density at zero on one hand is the geometrically speaking, the volume of the section. On the other hand, it has to do with the negative moments this time of those weighted sums. Now the celebrated Ball's theorem about maximum uh, volume section slices of the cube says that the, the maximum here is attained again at the vector one over root two, one over root two, zero, zero, zero. And this probabilistically can be equivalently stated as, because of this connection here, as the fact that if you send the negative uh, pth moment of S uh, with parameter P going to one, it will stay bounded by, by root two. If you, if you trace these, these constants here appropriately, this is really equivalent way of, of stating a Ball's theorem. Mm. Okay, so if you, if you normalize so that we are really talking about the minus pth moment of S, you will get an upper, you will get a lower bound, right? If you take the, to the negative one over P, this inequality will get reversed. So you will have a lower bound on, on this thing, okay, which can be because of the normalization that A is a unit vector, it can be viewed as, as a result that minus first moment is uh, lower bounded by the second moment. So again, you come from a higher moment and bounded by the lower moment. In this case, it's negative one. And the last slide is uh, about uh, an extension of this to fixed values of, of this moment P, okay? So with Yorgos Hasapis and Herman Koenig, we established the following, fix P between zero and one and consider this Kinchin's inequality for sums of independent now uniform random variables, okay? If you compare, if you want to up about the second moment, by the negative pth moment uh, in the non-trivial direction, it turns out that the sharp constant is again attained in either of the two cases that I mentioned earlier. It's either the Gaussian uh, case when p is between zero and uh, 0 0.79, da, da, da. and then the, the Sharex case takes over and, and that's why uh, in the limit, we also get a ball, balls result. Okay, I guess uh, that's all I, I have. Thank you.